Hello everyone, I'm Paul Shearing. I'm the Principal Investigator of the LiStar Programme or the Lithium Sulphur Technology Accelerator uh, and it's a pleasure to present to you work from our consortium today alongside my colleagues Nuria Garcia-Rez and James Robinson and we'll be looking at how we can commercialise lithium sulphur technology. So firstly just a brief introduction to the LiStar or Lithium Sulphur Technology Accelerator Programme. It is an academic industrial consortium which has been formed to address key challenges in lithium sulfur technology. It's a consortium of seven universities and eight major industrial partners, all with a shared philosophy to try and uh, accelerate the development and ultimately deployment of lithium sulfur technologies. We have adopted a whole cell approach, as you'll see from our work package structure, where we are looking to develop new materials and new processes and ultimately to deploy them in a prototype technologically relevant cell platform. Alongside the development of the technology, we're equally keen to identify potential early market opportunities for lithium sulfur technology. And we believe that early market opportunities that can particularly leverage the unique benefits of this chemistry will act as a catalyst for the wider industry. The programme is structured across four work packages. Work package one is looking at cathodes, Work package two looks at electrolytes and electrochemistry. Work package three provides an underpinning modeling framework and work package four looks at cell engineering and also incorporates our work on anode development. As well as close integration with our industry partners who share our philosophy in developing lithium sulfur technology, we're also closely integrated with a number of other programs within the Faraday community. And you'll see a couple of examples as we move through today's presentation. We are a large consortium and it's great that we've got a diverse group of investigators, both by background and in terms of their scientific discipline. Here's a rogues gallery of the co-investigators. I also want to acknowledge the real engine room of the project, which is our Faraday Institution Research Fellows that you can see on this slide, alongside our PhD students, many of whom have just joined the project in October 2020. So welcome to all of those and thanks for all of their inputs into the programme. A brief introduction to lithium sulfur technology and for those of you who are really interested you might also like to look for our Faraday Insights paper that was published by the Faraday Institution in July this year which goes into a lot more detail about the key benefits of lithium sulfur technology. With lithium ion batteries we've come to a point where we're close to the inherent limits of the technology in terms of their gravimetric and volumetric energy densities but for a range of applications those inherent limits provide insufficient energy or power demands and there is an increasing drive to explore next generation battery chemistries and of course there's a range of possibilities but many of these solutions are quite some way away and of the portfolio of next generation battery chemistries that are available lithium sulfur is comparably mature. The spider diagram on the right hand side actually comes from that Faraday Insights paper that I mentioned um, and highlights some of the key benefits of today's lithium sulfur technology, as well as projected improvements for future lithium sulfur technology. As you'll see, the key benefits include high gravimetric energy density, the low cost and abundance of the constituent materials, the benign environmental impact, and the potential for improved safety. You'll see that with current generation of lithium sulfur technologies indicated in orange, there are already some metrics, for example, gravimetric energy density, where lithium sulfur cells outperform lithium iron. But with the projections that we're making for improvements within the lithium sulfur technology accelerator, as well as in the community more generally, we are increasingly excited to see the benefits realized in terms of improvements to cost, safety, and environmental impact as well. But lithium sulfur is not a chemistry without challenges. So what are the challenges in some of the lithium sulfur technologies that we're exploring? Well, first of all, the sulfur reduction process takes place in multiple steps and is really some very complex electrochemistry. Unlike conventional lithium ion battery electrodes, the charge and discharge process actually involves phase changes from the solid to the liquid and back to the solid phase. And that in itself presents some key challenges associated with loss of inventory and the polysulfide shuttle effect which can ultimately lead to limitations in the capacity and the cycle life of a lithium sulfur cell. 
In conjunction, this, we, in conjunction with this, we also have to deal with the extremely low electrical conductivity of sulfur, the large volume expansion as the discharge products change during charge and discharge, the requirement for a relatively large volume of electrolytes, and the relatively slow kinetics of some of these processes. And so there is a rich set of scientific and engineering challenges that we're hoping to tackle across the LiveStar programme, both in our university labs and in partnership with our industrial collaborators. In targeting a commercial cell, there are some key things that we need to consider. As I've mentioned, we are adopting a whole cell approach to target improved lifetime and improved rates. In other words, we're not just focusing on one specific component within the cell, we're trying to develop them all in concert and ultimately to demonstrate a prototype cell within the programme. We have a focus on reducing the required excess in the anode and the electrolyte to make these as high performing cells and as cost competitive as possible. Um, and we are also uh, cognizant of the economies of scale that will come into place uh, when the technology is sufficiently matured. Um, clearly, the cost comparisons with lithium-ion technology are somewhat superficial at this stage because of the huge disparity in terms of the scale of manufacturing of lithium sulfur versus lithium-ion cells. But owing to the intrinsically low cost of materials abundance of the constituent components of lithium sulfur cells, we're very optimistic that we can make a very cost competitive cell. As we'll go on to talk about when we consider our scientific roadmap, um, we are key to match make lithium sulfur technology with early market opportunities that can best leverage the key benefits of lithium sulfur technology. So we are targeting applications that require a lightweight battery, one that requires buoyancy, improved safety, uh, and potentially high temperature tolerance as well. So early market opportunities that map onto these intrinsic characteristics of the lithium sulfur cell include heavy goods vehicles, personal power packs, marine applications, and I think perhaps most importantly, aerospace and satellite applications. We believe that the initial deployment of cells within these applications, which may be relatively niche, will improve the economies of scale to catalyze the wider industry. Next, I want to move on to think about some of the scientific case studies from within the Lifestyle programme. And first, I want to capture some work that we've undertaken at UCL to understand the impact of the synthesis and materials processing pathways on the ultimate performance of composite sulfur carbon electrodes that go into uh, lithium sulfur cells. And for those of you who are interested, you can see the citation to the Journal of Power Sources article that describes this work in significant detail. At the cathode electrode within a lithium sulfur cell, we typically have a mixture of sulfur and carbon, but the fabrication pathway, as well as the materials design, will have a really critical impact, not only on the initial performance of the cell, but also its durability. By the application of some advanced materials characterization and electrochemical characterization tools, we have a toolbox to evaluate the materials and the synthesis and processing routes. And you can see already we've, we've been able to achieve some quite impressive figures in terms of the gravimetric capacity of our lithium sulfur electrodes, having achieved more than 1500 milliamp hours per gram of sulfur in the initial cycles. But perhaps most importantly, we've established a toolbox that enables us to evaluate the materials design and the materials processing innovations that are coming from the Lifestyle Consortium. I'm going to pass on to my colleague, uh, Nuria Garcia Arez from Southampton, who's going to talk us through our next scientific case study. Many thanks, Paul. I'm very happy to present our new electrochemical sensor to study lithium sulfur batteries. And um, I would like to start by acknowledging the fantastic work that Nina did. She did pretty much all of the work and also extremely grateful to our collaborators from SIG, Energy Gune, Savi and Junmei. They provided the polymer electrolyte that was used in these experiments. So the way that Nina ran the experiments is in this particular cell configuration, which is a bit special because she put the sulfur electrode as a disk inside a ring, which was a lithium electrode. And this was done in this way because we know that when we discharge the cells to obtain the energy from, from the lithium sulfur cells, the first step is to 
produce the reduction of sulfur for I mean some polysulfides. So in this cell design, we can easily detect the formation of these polysulfides as they are uh, formed on the sulfur electrode and then they travel through the polymer electrolyte towards the sensor. And this was uh, very clear from the experimental data. So Nina uh, obtained the cyclic voltammogram of our sensor, and she could see that there was very little current involved in this voltammogram when there was no polysulfides being formed in the batteries. Whereas as soon as she started to discharge the lithium sulfur cell, which involves the formation of polysulfides, she could see this very big current and this characteristic uh, reversible voltammogram. Uh, corresponding to the redox activity of the polysulfides. So um, part of the success of this uh, work is in particular the use of a glassy carbon material as the electrochemical sensor. And this is because glassy carbon is particularly advantageous in terms of reproducibility and high sensitivity because it doesn't produce any side reactions apart from those redox reactions of polysulfides and the activity of glassy carbon as an inert electrode is very good. Um, so yeah, once uh, looking forward, why is this sensor useful? Well, there are many different possible applications. Uh, we have demonstrated that it can be used to detect in situ polysulfide formation, uh, which are the intermediates forming the batteries. And we can then use this knowledge to guide the development of lithium sulfur batteries to produce high capacity and fast reaction kinetics. And as you might see from this um, cell design that we developed, this uh, sensor is very useful to detect polysulfides and, all, and therefore it is very useful to test how effective uh, polysulfide blocking membranes are at blocking polysulfides. So that's another possible application. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nuria. Alongside our experimental work packages, we have an exciting portfolio of modeling work which is ongoing in the LiStar Consortium. One of the important aspects of this is the development of improved continuum models for lithium sulfur systems, and this is being led by Imperial College London. Developing robust zero and one dimensional models is key to better understanding both the cell's behavior and lifetime characteristics. And here we've integrated lithium sulfur models into the PIBAM framework, which has been developed by the Multiscale Modeling Project. If you'd like to hear a little bit more about this, Greg Offer has spoken to it in some depth in their talk earlier on. This work will simplify modeling for our more experimentally focused researchers, and will also aid the improved communication between our experimentalists and computational researchers who work in this field, while the fundamental developments in the battery models will also help the overall consortium aims of the LiStar program, so we're really ex excited to see where this goes in the future. As Paul highlighted previously, we've outlined a series of ambitious targets to improve the commercial prospects of lithium sulfur technology. Initially, these focus on improving the cell cycle life and the rate performance, However, we're really interested in improving specific aspects of the cells, including the volumetric energy density and better understanding the performance at extremes like low or high temperatures. Ultimately, we want to be able to demonstrate the consortium's development in a technologically relevant platform, and that's a key aspect of the LiStar, of the LiStar program. To aid the commercialization and accelerate the development of lithium sulfur, we've been guided not only by our own consortium's collective experience, but by our industrial partners and the existing literature. What you can see here is an outline of the sort of development process which will be required for our work. And this was outlined in 2018 by Tom Cleaver and some of the other LiStar co-investigators. You can see that by targeting a specific route, we can achieve a minimum viable product shown in Turquoise, which can then be tailored for application specific requirements. For instance, if you want an improved power, power requirements from your cell. Within this broader roadmap, we also have specific aims for each component of the cell. Here you can see our design framework for a lithium sulfur cathode, which highlights some of the key developments which might be required. So you might want to trap some of those polysulfides that Paul mentioned earlier, or accommodate the volumetric changes which occur during cell cycling. Simply, you might just want more sulfur in your cathode, and this outlines a pathways that you can achieve this. You can also see that these targets are not all necessarily consistent, and this points a way to a future where application-specific designs for cathodes are required in place of a kind of one-size-fits-all solution. However, in any system, there are a number of optimization requirements which, which are required and lithium sulfur is no different. What you can see here is some of the work we've undertaken as part of our LiStar road mapping effort, which will be published in the Journal of Physics Energy soon, and outlines, a number of, and outlines the impact of a number of these targets on lithium sulfur cells. 
So taking D, for instance, you can see the impact of reducing the electrolyte to sulfur loading on our cells. It's not just limited to minimizing our electrolyte volume. We can see that by optimizing our sulfur loading, sulfur content, and sulfur utilization, alongside optimizing the ratio of anode to cathode materials we can use, we can have a really big impact on the specific energy of our cells. And this is entirely consistent with, the, with previous literature. I'd just like to point you in the direction of some of our, uh, our co-investigators and researchers over the next couple of days. So Nuri will be delivering a talk in our cross-cutting three session tomorrow, but I'd really like to encourage you to take some time to have a look at some of the posters developed by our uh, postdoctoral researchers. Finally, I think it's really important for us to thank our researchers and partners for all their hard work over the last year, and to thank you for, for taking the time to listen to us today. Thanks a lot.